Your Majesty, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. As Klaus mentioned, we are here assembled coming from all walks of life and at the time where the world has become much more emotionalized. People are looking for answers to their problems and over the coming days, we will certainly all be engaged in the search for responses to the challenges we face. Just being rational is not enough to provide us with purpose in life. For this reason, as Klaus said, we are joined this week also by many cultural and spiritual leaders to provide us with inspiration and hope. It has become a cherished tradition at the beginning of each annual meeting in Davos to honor personalities who are great professionals, but at the same time incorporate a deep commitment to serve society. Artists are bridge builders and role models for the global community. They are challenging assumptions, bring new perspectives, and they seek to inspire collective action. There have been over 80 Crystal Awards winners, recipients over the decades, from musicians to filmmakers, from writers to architects, all of whom have been recognized for their commitment to advancing inclusive progress on issues like peace building, social inclusion, education, health, food security, environment and sustainability. The personalities we honor tonight with the Crystal Award are outstanding artists in their field, but at the same time, they engage in education and humanitarian action and to helping a new generation build a better global future. First, our the Ansofie Mutter. Ansofie Mutter receives the 2017 Crystal Award for her leadership in promoting musical education for youth. Music is only touching when it tells a story, says Ansofie Mutter, and I'm on the track of upcoming storytellers. Ansofie Mutter embarked on her international career as a soloist in 1976 at age 13 at the Lucerne Festival as part of the Young Artists series. A year later, she made her debut in Salzburg under Herbert von Karajan, with whom she worked for many years until his death. Today, Anne-Sophie Mutter is considered one of the greatest violinists of our time. She has performed with the Berlin and the New York Philharmonics amongst several of the world's leading orchestras and in all of the world's great concert halls. She's champion of contemporary music, and a number of pieces have been specially written for her or dedicated to her, like the piece by André Prévin that we will hear in a moment. And she uses her popularity for charity concerts, like the recent benefit concert for the project Integration Through Education for the Refugee Council in Leipzig. Her experience that young artists need targeted support during the decisive starting years led her to create the Friends of Anne-Sophie Mutter Foundation in 1997. Its objective is the global support of young, highly talented violin, viola, cello and contrabass soloists, providing scholarships and performing opportunities like the one tonight. We look very much forward to your performance with your students, the Mutters Virtuosi. Anne-Sophie Mutter, would you please join me on stage? Thank you very much indeed, dear Hilde Schwab, dear Professor Klaus Schwab, dear participants of the 2017 World Economic Forum, I would like to express my profound gratitude for the Crystal Award you have bestowed upon me, thereby making support for young musicians the focus of your attention. This award is not only an honor for me personally, but 
I consider it a mark of support and honor of the power of music to shape society. After all, the World Economic Forum has been committed to improving the state of the world for more than four decades. As a musician, I am deeply convinced that music also offers us a great opportunity to change the world for the better. For music not only builds metaphysical bridges, it is also free of any kind of ideology. Consider, as mere example, the social inspiration emanating from the West Eastern Divan Orchestra and the innumerable benefit performances which not only allow musicians to embrace the world, but also to help in a very concrete, hands-on manner. Their music is love transformed into sound. The words of the Apostle Paul seem particularly appropriate for them. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Music is always a gift to the listener, the viewer, the reader. It is an invitation to perceive the other as part of oneself, far removed from any religious or cultural differences. The work of my foundation supporting young musicians lies in emphasizing that the goal is not just playing one's instrument well, practicing assiduously and constantly and giving immaculate performances, if there's any such thing, but otherwise ignoring the world as if wearing blinders. My foundation is my attempt to send ambassadors of music out into the world, ambassadors who consider music their life's work, who find the meaning of life in working with and for others. Herbert von Karajan expressed many truths about music, and today I would like to recall one of them. The immense human craving for music proves how enormous our hunger for beauty and love has grown again, opposing the destructive powers of doubt and hatred. However, how do we who live in peace and plenty relate to those people for whom such a statement must seem like sheer mockery, because their lives might be threatened by armed conflict or hunger? We all have the images from the war in Syria etched into our hearts. Yet, that is only one humanitarian catastrophe among innumerable others. Altogether, five of the 7.4 billion people alive today live in states with armed conflicts. Sadly, this is not a new development. Rationally, we would have to conclude that mankind is quite obviously incapable of solving the problems it has caused. Do we want to accept this? During this four-minute speech of mine, 24 children have died due to malnutrition or undernourishment. According to the United Nations World Food Programme, almost 800 million people worldwide suffer from hunger, which means roughly every ninth person. Every year, 8 million people die of hunger, which means a death approximately every three seconds. I am convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that all of us assembled in this hall consider world hunger an unbearable human catastrophe. After all, sufficient food, knowledge, and the means to eradicate hunger exist. We are not faced with the problem of insight, but of implementation. We are faced with our own inability to end this humanitarian catastrophe quickly. The Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations 2030 Agenda, which all member states adopted in September 2015, defines zero hunger as one of its 17 goals, 
meaning a complete eradication of hunger by the year 2030. In October 2016, one year after the 2030 Agenda was passed, the Global Hunger Index already raised the alarm in its annual report, I quote, Altogether, the decline in hunger must accelerate if the world is to achieve zero hunger by 2030. End of quote. Thus, it is already obvious today that the efforts of politicians, businessmen and civil society must be significantly increased in order to reach the goal of zero hunger by the year 2030. If one could eat resolutions and words, nobody would starve. I appeal to you, ladies and gentlemen, because each of you is able to make an active and significant contribution to improving the nutrition situation throughout the world. Ignore the call of the sirens for even more wealth and power and follow the calling to be truly human. That is, to protect the poor and weak, the suffering and the innocent. Please consider the following concert as our personal thanks from us musicians for the activities we hope to see from you. May they be in keeping with the forum's mission and committed to improving the state of the world and possibly also being in the spirit of Schiller's ode to joy. The world needs more of a sense of brotherhood, love and empathy. Together we can heal the world. Yes, we can. Thank you. Our next awardee is Shakira. Shakira receives the 2017 Crystal Award for her leadership in advancing early childhood education. Of course, we all know Shakira as one of the most successful Latin singers with over 60 million albums sold, numerous MTV, Grammy and Billboard Music Awards for songs and albums that are on the playlists of people around the world. At the same time, Shakira is a passionate advocate for education, particularly early childhood development. In 1997, at age 18, she founded the P.S. Descalzos Foundation, which develops support programs to improve the education, nutrition, and health of the most vulnerable children in her native Colombia. Shakira was appointed the UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador in 2003, advocating to ensure that all children have access to quality education and encouraging the investment in early childhood development. In 2011, President Obama appointed Shakira to his advisory commission on educational excellence for Hispanics. Shakira, would you please join me on stage? Thank you so much. Thank you for the honor of this award and for the opportunity to speak to you all. Today, we know more than ever about the early years of child development, especially that of the brain. The brain of a child who's nourished and nurtured, read to and played with, protected from factors like stress and conflict, has the best chance of developing its full potential because it's proven that children who receive proper care, nutrition, and stimulation in the first five years do much better in school and in life. Sadly, this is not the case in my country. 
or in so many other countries in the developing world, where being born into poverty means never breaking out of it. We should be devastated that in 2017, there are still 250 million kids under five who are still at risk, who will likely be stunted physically and intellectually. Now take that in for a second. We're talking about nearly the population of an entire country the size of the US. This is a tragedy for those children and an epic, epic failure for all of us. If we don't attend to these kids in time, we're talking about intergenerational cycles of poverty and inequality. And the wider the gap of inequality grows, the harder it becomes to reach across it. And the more numerous the faces of those born into poverty, the more difficult to see and empathize with each individual and recognize that if not for the pure geography of where they were born, they could be one of our children. This should make us all furious. They should make us all want to take action because we all have a stake in the outcome. The world is facing some serious challenges. By 2050, massive population growth is expected and we will need to feed 9 billion people or we will risk being at the threshold of conflict and starvation. Will this generation of kids be ready to take on the task of eliminating malnutrition and providing food security? Will they be prepared to come up with solutions and innovations to climate change, unemployment, and the most complex issues that our society faces? Who will help us manage our resources more efficiently and sustainably going forward from here to the next 20 years? It's your kids. It's Milan and Sasha, my kids. And it's those 250 million kids at risk who need us to tip the scales back in their favor. Today's babies will drive tomorrow's business. Tomorrow's, today's babies with their future productivity will fuel tomorrow's economies. Their capacity to contribute will shape tomorrow's societies, will solve tomorrow's problems. All of you, all of you here today have a critical, critical role to play. So what can you do? Let's face it, in this room there are some of the most powerful people in the world and definitely I'm convinced that you know what it means to be ahead of the curve and you can be tremendously influential. We need to apply the brains and strategies of business and the assets and the human resources and the talents of your companies to do social good and to solve social problems. All of us need to pick up where governments leave off. That's the only way. And that said, it's not about letting governments off the hook. On the contrary, it's about re-engaging them. But we have to take the first steps because as business leaders, as, as business people, we have the ideas, the agility, the organizational skills, the manpower, the female power, of course. <laughs> when we started building schools in Colombia, we chose the most remote areas uh, where there was literally nothing. There was no paved roads, no potable water, no electricity. And where historically the government had checked out, we checked in. And we decided to build not only schools, but state-of-the-art schools. And we decided to include ECD as our key component. And we created comprehensive programs, comprehensive, a comprehensive model that included as well school feeding programs, parent and teaching training. We engaged the government as our strategic partner, and we made it nearly impossible for them to say no to doing their part. So the transformation in these communities could be seen immediately, from the jobs generated to the hope inspired, but the improvements to the infrastructure were jaw-dropping. 
Electricity and potable water were made accessible. Roads were paved. Malnutrition plummeted. And the best part of all, the students responded academically so well that now those kids who could have been recruited by guerrillas or drug traffickers are on their way to the university or are in the university as we speak or are thriving in their communities. So now I don't have to call, call the governments as often, thank God. <laughs> now they call us wanting to build more schools, wanting to invest more. So I'm not suggesting it's easy, but there is an exit strategy to poverty. And it's getting those 250 million kids who are at risk, who need access to quality ECD programs so they get in school and stay in school. We have to push governments to invest more on ECD. We have to invest in campaigns for public awareness. We have to make access to pre-K education free. And we have to create a fund for education, just like AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis have their own fund. I know I can sound vehement, as Bono once called me. And it's because I am. He's completely right. And I know I can drive some people nuts with my insistence, but it's only because I'm so passionate. And the reason why I'm so passionate is because I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen what education can do, what the investment in education can do. Miracles. And believe me, there is nothing more fun and satisfying than seeing a child who had almost no possibilities to succeed, flourish, and thrive, and perform well in life. For me, it beats even winning a Grammy any day. <laughs> we can't press pause and ask those kids to wait to grow up until we have it all figured out. There isn't a moment to lose. We need to invest in humans. It's the smart thing to do, the strategic thing to do, and the just thing to do. Thank you. Next Crystal Award goes to Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker receives the 2017 Crystal Award for his leadership in peace building and conflict resolution. Forrest Whitaker is a globally recognized actor, director, and producer for his masterful performance as the Ugandan dictator Idi Amin in the film The Last King of Scotland. He won an Academy Award and Golden Globe, among many other accolades. For that role, he learned Swahili and engaged in intense research in the field. He interviewed family members and victims of Idi Amin. This is characteristic of his approach to film, and he is well known for intensive character study, as in such other films as Bird, Ghost Dog, or The Butler. That intensity carries through to his work in the area of peace building and conflict resolution. He is the founder of the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, which works in the United States, Mexico, Uganda, and South Sudan, to bring young women and to empower them to become peace leaders and agents of positive transformations in their countries and communities. He spends 70% of his time doing humanitarian work and is on mission almost every month in some of the most dangerous places on Earth. He also is the co-founder and chair of the International Institute for Peace and a UNESCO Special Envoy for Peace and Reconciliation. Last year, Forrest Whitaker was appointed to the Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Group by the UN Secretary General. Mr. Whitaker, would you please join me on stage?
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hilda Swaben, Klaus Swaben. Thank you for those words, too, because education is the key. It's really good to hear that being spoken out loud so strongly. Uh, I want to thank you for your amazing work that you've done over the last years, bringing artists and, and leaders together to help shift the consciousness of the world. I share this award with the extraordinary young women and men that I work with through my foundation, the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative. These youths live in parts of the world impacted by violence and poverty. Our mission is to help them realize their potential as leaders, community developers, conflict mediators. To achieve this, we provide them with training in conflict resolution, life skills, computer technologies, and in social entrepreneurship or business development. We share with these young leaders that throughout history, progress happens when ordinary women and men come together and decide to become the change that they want to see in the world. Together, our youth peacemakers form a global network of peacemakers and activists who are developing projects in their communities to combat poverty, then hunger, advance education, gender equality, to address inequalities of women, to address conflict-related crises, some of these programs are designed specifically for protection of civilian camps, refugee camps, helping to ease the suffering of the 65 million men and women and children currently displaced by violence. This work is local, but it's global. We see our youth peacemakers as partners who are working on the front lines to help achieve the fulfillment of humanity's needs, to help achieve the, what the United Nations is calling the Sustainable Development Goals. In Uganda, we work with former child soldiers who are not only working as conflict resolutionists, and they're working also to build their communities. They're building electronic stores, salons. They're providing training uh, and employment opportunities to vulnerable youth. In Tijuana, Mexico, our youth peacemakers are, are leading skill building sessions for inmates in prisons. They're teaching anti-bullying classes in schools. In South Sudan, which is a nation that's torn apart, torn apart by, by violence and civil war, local officials in those two states are now using these peacemakers as mediators. And in the midst of this current crisis, several of, the, of these youth negotiated an agreement. And I was, I was really moved by it. They negotiated an agreement with the SPLA, with the army that was occupying a school to get them to leave the school so the children will be able to be able to go to class. Another has become uh, the head of the president of the youth union. Another became a member of parliament. We live in a deeply, deeply connected world, as you've said. And the accumulation of violent and conflict across the globe has the potential to create an atmosphere for all of us of hopelessness and despair thinking that how can we solve this problem? You can, along with everyone else. There are ordinary heroes also who are working out here, all around the world, trying to help us, to help rekindle the flame of hope for all of us, to let us know that it is possible if we work together. It is possible if we form alliances and partnerships it is possible to, to change the dynamic and tip the scale the other way. There's a microscopic organism that lives in the ocean. It's bioluminescent. It lights up the sky like a firefly in the ocean. But it only does this when enough of these individuals come together with a singularity of purpose. And their purpose is to produce light. And when they do this, when that tipping point happens, there's this giant sheath of light that forms in the ocean, illuminating that part of it. Wouldn't it be remarkable if we as human beings did the same thing? If we came together amassing our collective knowledge, our, our energy, our hearts, our souls, our assets, joining forces with the ordinary heroes across this planet 
for a singular purpose, to create light and peace in every corner of the world. I believe it is possible. I know it's possible. I believe in the power of all of you. I believe in all the powers that I've seen walking the streets in every city that I've ever been in my life. And I think together, together, we can make a difference. As I tell our youth peacemakers every day, progress happens when ordinary people come together to change the world. Thank you for being here this week. Thank you for this great, great honor. And thank you for what you're going to do as you look inside yourselves and connect with each other to help make this a planet, a world that we should all be proud to live in. Thank you. This concludes our Crystal Award ceremony. I would like to thank the awardees again for joining us and for contributing to our program. They stand as good examples for the many here in the hall who engage with passion and compassion to make the world a better place. We will listen to a wonderful concert in a moment, but please join me in thanking again the Crystal Awardees and congratulating them. Thank you.